G'day guys, Ron here from Osborne Digital Marketing. Today I have my lovely friend, Alex Adikola from Incept Technologies, and we're going to discuss everything about reputation management so you can make sure you have a solid, positive online reputation management. Hey Alex, how you doing my friend? Good, how are you? Yeah, I can't complain, dude. Excited, I get to learn all about reputation management and your weird and wonderful world today, brother. So thanks for awesome. joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. No, no worries, my friend. Dude, would you like to kick the show off by introducing yourself? Would you like to just let us know how you got into this? So how you sort of got into this different world of, it is SEO, but tying that in to actually help people and their businesses online and what it actually encompasses. <laughs> I started out building websites back in the day. So when I say back in the day, I mean, when people were using Dreamweaver uh, front page before WordPress and Joomla came about. And um, so I was doing that freelancing after college. And then I got embedded with an agency doing websites for them. So it was a small agency in Ybor City in Tampa, Florida. So I was doing that, um, kind of working with another dude who was more of a programmer running like their email marketing and other internet marketing stuff. So I did that for a while. Then I kind of, I got a job being a web developer. Then 2008 hit. Once 2008 hit, uh, I got laid off from that job. And then I started building websites on my own uh, with Incept Designs. That was the original name. And then it kind of morphed into Incept Technologies. Um, during that time, building websites, I when you build websites, businesses like want to, they're like, how do I promote the website? How do I get traffic? So it naturally kind of delves into SEO. And then I also needed a way to get clients. So I learned SEO myself. And back then it was a lot easier than it is now. Um, there was, you know, it was pre-Panda, pre-Penguin, pre-whatever. It was just basically stuff the title tag and you know you would rank and then we you know that was local business was a lot easier getting gmbs was a lot easier um everything was just a lot easier and i kind of focused on doing it for contractors um so i did that for a really a while and then i got burnt out in about 2014 and uh went into the insurance world for a little while did some insurance adjusting and uh kind of jumped back into it how I got into reputation management was I inadvertently got arrested. <laughs> and as an SEO consultant, uh, my mugshot was on the internet. And that is not a good thing. If you work for yourself and people are Googling you, you don't want any kind of negative information, especially like a mugshot showing up because people you know, will judge you by that. Yeah. So I worked to get that down. And then I kind of documented that process. And then I kind of turned it into an ebook. And then I built a little website for that. And it was like a little side project. and um, it was kind of like a side project that never went away and I didn't, people just kind of wanted the service. They didn't really want to read about it. They didn't want to learn about it. They just wanted somebody to do it for them. So it just kind of grew out of that. Dude, that's fantastic. That's, that's one way of getting into an industry, you know, like that is, that's yeah. one way of, uh... <laughs> just kind of Man. fell into it. Yeah, dude. Far out, bro. So when it comes to reputation management, like I guess sort of leaning on the side, I guess we can focus on individuals because I think it's absolutely fascinating the path you've gone down now with removing mug shots primarily, but also with businesses, you help businesses build their online reputation management. If we focus on the removal of mug shots, dude, like that must be a big game. And I know, like, I know that I've had people come to me and I've sent over to you to help, help with them, uh, to remove their presence, the negative stuff online. Obviously we can't say who they are, but it has mm. happened. Is it a big industry? Like, are you finding that you work with a lot of big popular people? Like, is this a, is this something that's kind of, you know, <laughs> like not talked about because it's all shunned? I think it is a bigger industry than people realize. People don't really think about it until it happens to them and they become involved in a situation. Um, as far as like mugshot removal, there generally were only three other firms that were doing it. Well, maybe two, because one of the firms has like a multitude of websites. And then now you see lawyers getting into it. So lawyers will have a mugshot removal page and then they'll try to funnel those clients into expungement and sealing their record. Um, you also see now Reputation Defender, um, and they have like a, you know a big branding campaign going on where they're running ads on national TV here in America, and uh, they're bought by or they're owned by Norton Antivirus, so that is a huge segment of it. And then also data privacy is kind of merging into the reputation management field. So in America, it's kind of like the wild wild west with 
data aggregators and people scraping information. It could be arrest records. It could be property records. It could be voter information. It could be marital information. It could be any kind of information, court dockets, and putting that information online and then running ads against it and things like that. So it is a big industry and it seems like it's getting bigger. And you'll also see, like for instance, the Cambridge Analytica situation with Facebook. I don't know if you remember that. After that happened, they were running ads. So reputation management is definitely a segment of PR that is just kind of not as sexy and as glamorous. So it doesn't get talked about as much since we're more dealing with black swan events or crisis management. And, and what do you find still keeping it on the individuals? Like how damaging do you find it when someone, as an example, like I know in the States, in Australia, as an example, back home in Australia, someone gets arrested, like, mate, we're, we're a colony of convicts. Like it's that simple. So, so it's not as extreme, but in the States, it's, it's pretty extreme. And a lot of our records in Australia are hidden in the back end, so to speak. It, it's not it's not publicly accessible like it is in the US. How impactful do you like find that being? Have you got any horror stories where people were going for maybe CEO positions or a- anything? They were going to land a solid job, and someone just did a simple Google search, and that ruined their their future life. Yeah, I mean, one example that comes to mind is a teacher who. Um had some allegations made by him that were pretty serious by some students who just thought it was a joke. It was funny. Um, He ended up getting arrested and later exonerated. And when he was arrested, there were numerous news stories published about the incident and that, you know, hampered him for getting a career for, so that's kind of like the, you could be inadvertently arrested, which sounds kind of silly, but you could be in a situation where let's say you date somebody and they're abusive and you don't know that. And one night they get drunk and an altercation happens, the police come and they don't know whose side of the story to believe. And you might be the person who gets arrested. Um, other instances, or you could just be mistaken for somebody else that's wanted and the police take you into custody until they figure out who you are, until they complete their investigation, they release you. So then you, if you're booked, you have a mugshot. And that could be published on a number of third-party websites that just want to run advertising and so forth. And that can be damaging. Um, So yeah, it is an issue, especially with just individuals and especially if it's an individual where their personal brand or trust is, you know, in a a major part or a serious part of like their job. So for instance, like a real estate agent or a financial planner, someone along those lines, a teacher, you know, you don't want anyone watching your kids who could be possibly violent or have been arrested so people see those mugshots or booking photos. They don't necessarily do the research to see if the person was actually guilty or not. They just make a an assumption off of that initial perception or initial impression and then move on from it. So it can be really impactful for people um, if they have those kind of um, they have those kind of records or any kind of information like that online. Man, that's yeah, I could see that being very detrimental. And, and with like my, my question is too, and it's, specifically for the audience man this stuff even if it's proven to be false does google like as an example when someone copied my website i reported them i did the whole dcma takedown you know we do all of that but when it comes to the average joe the average individual that that actually might happen to someone might put out a false allegation goes up on google everywhere does Google have any responsibility to take that stuff down or is it really up? The only way you can get it down is by using your services to come along and help push and suppress that all down. Both. Um, Google doesn't necessarily have an obligation, um, but they do have forms where you can report um, content that's harmful content that has exploitative practices for removal. So Generally, they're thinking in terms of things that are illegal, like revenge porn is, a, is an example that comes to light. Um, they also have things, they have a form where you can request removal for content that reveals personal information. So if like there's some detailed information or doxing going on, they will take that down. Now, Google, it, when they, they have so many requests that they get, they have some kind of automation or some kind of system that filters it. And so people may or may not find success using that, but there is that option um, to do that, to submit uh, to Google for them to remove. Same with Bing, um, but some people don't know that. Some people don't understand how to navigate that process. So that's where we would come in to help them with that. 
There is DMCA takedowns as well. You can also reach out to the hosting company of a website. So if a website's publishing some information and it's copyrighted or uh, it's illegal or it's slanderous, the, sometimes the hosting company will preemptively take it down and then ask whoever owns that website to respond to those allegations and then make a decision as to whether or not they're going to republish it or keep it down permanently. So you do have both options. It just depends on the person and their experience and how comfortable they are with navigating those type of uh, forms and and trying to get that information taken down. That would be very brutal, bro. Like when, apart it from can that be horror a process. Yeah, yeah. Apart from that horror story before, dude. Like, has there been anyone that it's been really unjust and? It was again like similar to the horror story with with the unfortunate teacher. Has there been any horror stories? I know you can't give up clients' names, and I know you can't really be very very specific with it. Um, obviously, with the confidentiality agreements, but has there been anything where this hasn't been able to be like hasn't worked, but all of this stuff's been left out there online? Because like that terrifies me, dude. That the fact that someone could come along tomorrow and just be quite savvy with the internet and then put out something really bad. Like oh, obviously SEO is my game, but still, dude. Like if someone's smarter than me and they were to go out there and put all of that out there, knowing that that can't be brought down, has, has that ever happened, man? Like where it's just it's too challenging sometimes. Uh, I mean, the most probably tragic reputation management story i think i've heard um <clears throat> is about the streamer and I, and I apologize i don't know her name um but there were two strict twitch streamers and they were friends and um one was a girl one was a male and then the, the male stripper stripper the male streamer he uh i was on a like a deep fake porn site and he put the other streamer's head on a different woman and then inadvertently showed it to his audience and so people screenshot it and then published it and it kind of spread around on the internet. And um, just listening to her talk about it in a podcast and just like the psychological impact of having somebody, you know, like mm. I can't really imagine that personally. Um, like if a girl did that and put my head on like a different dude's body, like me personally, I like it would look at it completely different, I think, than women would just because of society and the different pressures and things that are placed on them. Uh, in that respect, that is probably the most serious and kind of like catastrophic um, reputation management thing that I could think of. But there is always the um, gentleman who he headbutted a, a waiter in South Florida at a restaurant. I think we talked about him. He's not my client, um, <laughs> but there is also the Streisand effect where sometimes people will try to suppress something. And then you have kind of like an internet army or some people who feel like this should be out there and it should be something that the public should be aware of. And they will repost that information. And like every so often, every couple of months, you'll see somebody will be like, let's not forget so-and-so on Reddit and repost that information. So that's something that was inescapable for him. Um, we've all seen like viral incidents of people who, who we might call Karens or they attack people or they lose their temper, you know, their cameras and video cameras and, and cell phones and things like that are everywhere. So it's kind of like you always have to be cognizant of how you act in public. But I think that's probably a greater risk for people is having a meltdown in public or losing their temper in public over a situation and it being recorded and going viral more so than somebody just kind of attacking you in the business world. I mean, negative SEO attacks do happen and that is a threat. But I feel like in terms of damaging your reputation probably the more serious thing is like getting into a road rage incident or you know somebody taking your parking spot or you getting cut in line on black friday and you know losing your temper um yeah. and that seems to happen a lot more especially after the pandemic it seems like um oh bro so how do how do people avoid that so let's just say obviously it comes into adopting a more stoic approach towards life which is definitely missing in this day and age <laughs> But, video. <laughs> yeah, but when it comes to let's just say they have lost it and it is up there online how can the average person try and suppress a bit of bad pr that they've gotten so let's just say ronnie osborne's jumped out of the car because someone's cut me off what am i doing dude what am i like how am i pushing down that video what what, what are some basic things i could probably do 
I think you have to outbad the good or outbad the bad with good. So basically you're going to have to flip that around. So uh, like, so I guess the best example of that would be the owner of the Patriots. He was busted uh, in South Florida for uh, being at like a massage parlor that got raided. So there's a lot of bad press about him in regards to that. Now, since he has a lot of leverage, since he owns a football team, there's a lot of other positive press. So if you search his name, you won't see that. Now, when it first happened, if you search his name, you would see that information. But now he's had so much press about his football team that that is kind of suppressed. Unless you specifically look for it, you won't see it. So in a situation, if you get into where, like, let's say somebody records you and you're flipping out, um, you're going to have to create the same content, make it where it's engaged with more and that it's high on sites that are higher authority. So you basically have to kind of create your own content that's going to push it down. And then so one of the ways you're going to push it down is by creating a lot of content. So more of that content than, than whatever the one video is, and then putting it in more places than that one video is. And then also having other people talk about the content that you created more than the other content is being talked about. So if you were to go viral, it would be kind of... A, a large task, a large undertaking to kind of suppress that, but it is possible to suppress it and push it down. Um, it's just depending on the resources that you have available and the time and the effort that you're willing to put into it or the agency is willing to put into it. That's pretty scary, man. Like when you think about it, <laughs> the fact that, you know, like, Hey, we all make mistakes, but you know, it can be some small mistake. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be penalized for jumping out of your car and breaking someone's windshield. <laughs> you definitely should be <laughs> yeah. dragged over the coals for that. But yeah, something minor, like you said, like maybe old mate had no idea that that was a bad place to be. Mate, mate, genuinely, he was just like, I'm knackered. I need a massage. And they were the only ones open. <laughs> and that's probably why they got raided because they'll open at midnight as an example. Yeah. I don't know the story, but <laughs> they put in two and two together. Uh, <laughs> like... But yeah, man, that's, that's scary. That's, that is honestly a bit scary for the average person. And when, when it comes to online reputation management for businesses, how do you approach that differently? So wh where should businesses be looking to make sure that they have a positive online reputation management and where can they avoid bad press? Like what is something that the average business owner could do you know, that is just constantly having the positive stuff up the top in Google, so to speak, compared to any negative things slipping through. What are some things that they could do to ensure that happens? Probably social media is the biggest thing. Um, the most negative press that most businesses are going to receive are bad reviews. So there's software out there that you can use to basically review gate. It's kind of a term now. It may violate certain policies of other of different content providers. So Google may not or like something like that, but there is a where you, if you're proactive with gathering a review, and then if let's say that person leaves a review that's negative, then that gives you an opportunity to reach out to that person and rectify whatever it was that caused a negative review, whether it's customer service, whether it was food, whether it was the product, whatever issue it might've been. And then you can either have them once that situation has been rectified, they will either leave, leave you a positive review or at least you prevent them from leaving a negative review. The second thing you can do is just be on top of your social media. So a lot of times people will tweet at businesses in terms of if they're dissatisfied or leave a Facebook comment. So having some type of software to monitor your social media presence or what we call sentiment monitoring. So basically looking at what's being said about your business and certain keywords and then looking for those words that are associated with a negative sentiment or a positive sentiment, um, training your employees. So employees um, that have access to social media or that can post online, making sure that they understand what to say and what they can't say. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an interesting thing that happened with Bud Light where they chose a certain influencer and they weren't really aligned with the target audience that they had. And people started to boycott them. And that's actually been a boycott that's been pretty serious and it's really <laughs> hit their bottom line. So, and that's not necessarily like negative PR per se, but you really have to be cognizant of your brand and what you're saying and the voice and the narrative that you're providing and who your actual customers are and who is buying your product or services. Um, that is probably the biggest thing is just not losing touch with who your actual people are, who's paying the bills, who like really enjoys your product or service. And when let's just say, let's say I've got a business, uh, you 
as an example, thankfully, if you look up Osborne Digital Marketing online, it's it's okay. But let's mm. just say it wasn't. How do you go about rectifying that in Google where I could push down bad news and only show good news? Is there any tricks in the trade you can give up there for the average business owner? Uh, tricks are just, honestly, the main trick is reaching out. Like if somebody's publishing something negative about you, um, reach out to that person and see if they'll take it down. If it's a news organization, you can look on the website and there'll be contact information. There'll also be FCC information and there's a specific contact for um, the FCC that they have to have. So if you don't get a response from the editor, you can kind of reach out there. You can also look those people up on LinkedIn. Excuse me, you can send them a message on LinkedIn and that will kind of get you through the noise of email as well. Um, in terms of pushing things down, just kind of being proactive. So like there's a lot of websites you can, I mean, there's a lot of websites, social media websites that you can publish your information on. So when I mean, you have YouTube, you have Twitter, you have Instagram, you have Facebook, you have Clubhouse, you have um, a Facebook page that you can make specifically about your business. You have, you know, you could have a Shopify store. You could have different free blogs like WordPress or Weebly or Wix or Squarespace in addition to just your main domain if you're trying to push something down in terms of like your brand and so if, if something is appearing for your brand search. Um, also contacting platforms. If something is uh, negative or incorrect or if you have some kind of legal basis to possibly get that information taken down, you might want to have, if you have access to a lawyer, you can have them send a cease and desist letter to whatever platform or hosting company and see if that will work to get it taken down. Um, there's a lot of different approaches that you can take, but the first thing to do is just generally ask the person, be polite and say, hey, can you take this down? It doesn't accurately, accurately represent our business or the situation that occurred and, and talk to the person. Be like, hey, is there anything I can do to get this taken down and see what their approach is? And then if they're not, you know, going to be accommodative, then you might want to do something else that might be able to have a little more muscle or have a little more persuasion to them. So with negative SEO, is that being used a lot within the industry of damaging businesses' reputations online? So not only going out there and sending bad backlinks to tank a website, but are you actually finding people are being a little bit more creative with negative SEO, such as leaving fake reviews, and doing that to businesses now, are you seeing that that's more prevalent? Uh, I do see that occur, but most of the situations when that occurs, um, the example I can think of was there was a gentleman, I believe he was in a Jeep, he was road raging, and um, somebody posted the video and they figured out who he was and they figured out what business he owned. And I want to say it was like a, uh, like they installed gas fireplaces in the person's and people's homes. And so people were going there leaving one-star reviews. There was also a, a lawyer who represented um, somebody in a very controversial type of case. A lot of people didn't agree with what the person did. So they would go to that lawyer's website and leave them negative reviews. Now, Google and I want to say Yelp, they kind of can see that that review velocity increases like way above the norm. And they kind of will temporarily disable that or like leave a notice like right now the reviews are under, you know, something's going on that's like out of the ordinary. There's an anomaly. Um, but those are the most common instances I see of people leaving re negative reviews. Now you do get your average competitor who's going to leave you a negative review, um, just be an ass, you know, and, and try to get a leg up on you. And there's not much you can do, but except maybe leave one to them if you wanted to go that route. Um, but unfortunately, that's just kind of the nature of the industry. The best thing you can do is stay authentic to your service or your product or um, whatever it is that you do and make sure you provide a good customer experience so that, that people understand and the sentiment outweighs any of those type of random peoples and one-offs that will come and, and try to leave a negative review about your business. Dude, you, you touched on data privacy before. Like, How do you see data privacy like hitting us all in the future, man? Because I'm, I'm not going to lie, dude. I never had my face on camera before digital marketing before I really got heavily involved in this for a reason, uh, for like, honestly, this is something I was quite concerned about. And I am a bit nervous in the future. Obviously we've all seen what the creative people in our industry have done with, <laughs> with, with some of our mates, <laughs> YouTube channels. I think it was Chris and Craig, they had their voices twisted and turned and yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit concerning. 
So how do you also help prevent some really, really bad things going on? Like how do we, how do we stop that, man? I know that might sound a little bit technical, but it would be really insightful for the average Joe that just wants to use the internet, surf on the internet, use it to, as a thing to just serve their their wishes, you know, where they can go on there, do whatever they want, but still be protected. What are some basic things the average average Joe could do to make sure they're safe? Um, One thing I would think is just being cognizant of where you're posting, like not posting anything per se. So like I deleted my Facebook account, I want to say it was in 2010, um, it was way before Cambridge Analytica, way before um, a lot of the privacy scandals that they had and different breaches that they had and so forth. I don't want to say breaches, but they changed their privacy rules and then things that you had posted that were private before all of a sudden became public and people could see them. So not putting anything out there is probably the main thing that you could do, I would say. Um, so for instance, just posting a picture, if you snap a picture, now cell phones and so forth, they'll strip out that exit data. But before, you could have your location posted online just because it was embedded in the exit data in a photo. So, and then another thing is, is startup. There's a startup called Clearview AI. So Clearview AI, what they did was they created a, an app for law enforcement agencies. And basically, they scraped all the public photos that were available online and then trained a facial recognition algorithm based on those photos. And then so if there was somebody who'd committed a crime and they had surveillance video or some kind of photo of them, they would match it against this database that Clearview AI had created and then say, oh, this is possibly who this person is. So in terms of data privacy, there really isn't any privacy, I feel like, anymore. Um, but the, the thing that's kind of more scary, I feel like, with data privacy is just the... If like for Amazon, for instance, like Amazon knows a lot about you, like just because they know what you purchase, when you purchase, how much you purchase, and then what type of people people purchase these items. And then they can recommend things to you and you'll instantly buy that and they make it so easy to buy something that you don't realize it. And then, you know, we all know about Cambridge Analytica and, and how that unfolded in terms of, I don't know if anyone actually looked at that CEO's presentation, but they basically took different behaviors and things that are important to people and they realize like if you're going to talk about guns to an older person who has a family and grandchildren you might want to talk about them hunting and spending time with their grandchildren in terms of that gun whereas if it's a younger person who's a, just a young professional it might be a female you might want to talk about self-protection so they've figured out how to match certain topics that they want people to be closely aligned with and and present that information to them in a way that really resonated with them based on their interests, based on what they liked, based on who else they were connected to and what other people who are liking those similar things and so forth would do. So people don't realize how much different data there is. So you have a network of connection of friends that you have on Facebook. Then you have all the things you liked, you have all the places you've checked in, you have all the events that you've gone to, you have, your cell phone that's connected to the to the Facebook app and it has location data that's tracking in the background. It's probably listening because it's if you're using one like Siri or Bixby, it's probably recording that audio. So there's a lot of data that's just being aggregated. So another thing to think about is Amazon Alexa. So your Amazon Alexa, you just talk to it. So it has to be listening all the time for you to just talk to it. Um, that data now is whenever we talk about it being used it's used in a way that people won't disagree with. So it's like, oh, the guy was convicted of murdering somebody because Alexa heard the argument, heard the commotion, and heard X, Y, Z. So people don't really think about it. Because, oh, that person was doing something they really shouldn't be doing. But that creeps. You know, that line can keep creeping and creeping and creeping. And then, you know, they might say, well, we want to use this data, and we're not going to tell anybody that we're using it, but we want to listen and know, like, they might listen and, and know if somebody's pregnant. So they might show you ads or, you know, baby diapers or things like that. And it's like, how creepy and invasive does the technology get? So in terms mm -hmm. of data privacy, I think the best thing that you could do is just not engage in in the different apps, not engage in the, if it's convenient for you and it's providing like, a, like for instance, uh, you know, the Alexa is convenient, but it's also, there's a cost to that convenience. So you're, you're the product. If it's free, they say you're the product. So 
just being cognizant of everything because every time you do something, it's probably being saved and recorded because storage costs have gone down. And then now we have AI to kind of analyze vast amounts of data and find different patterns. So it's inescapable, but still just being you know cognizant of it. I think more important too is to be aware of what your children are doing, making sure that they are educated on the implications of oversharing or providing information to strangers online because those that I feel like would pose a bigger threat. Most adults are kind of aware of these things nowadays. I'm like, you're not going to answer a phone call from somebody you don't know who it is just because it's like, you need that data. You need to know who it is because it's privacy. You have to be kind of connected with that person and intimate with that person before you just can interrupt my life. So just being aware and I think being minimalist with your data, avoiding, I think Facebook, I think is a great tool, but I think probably it's best to just have an account that's not really connected to your name or your information. Um, and Alexa, I probably wouldn't have one of those. Like I don't have one like the Bixby or Siri. I probably wouldn't turn that information on. I know Apple is pretty, um, when the whole Cambridge Analytica thing came out, they used that as an opportunity to talk about privacy and how secure the iPhone was and your data stays here and had some really good, um, advertising around that. And I thought it was really clever that they did that. And they kind of are butting heads with Facebook in terms of privacy and like having that kind of market share and so forth. Um, but there's a lot like, so little keychains when you go to the grocery store and you scan to get the points and get the, get the sale price. Cause you got to scan that little barcode. I mean, that information is being tracked, you know, is your real information connected to that? Would you fill out that form? So I think it's inescapable. Um, it's just being, aware of it kind of a long answer yeah so basically what you're saying is we're doomed <laughs> it was great uh, brother. <laughs> kind of i mean the i mean it's really lax here in the u.s in terms of like data collection and what the data what you're doing with the data like california has their own laws and they're kind of the pioneer on this forefront of data privacy but you know there's there's no real regulation on any of that so unfortunately mm. You know, back in Australia, as an example, it's uh, it's illegal to cold email. Someone has to have opted in. In America, baby, Woo, we let it run. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we let it run. I think it's illegal in Canada as well, too. Yeah. The Can Spam Act. Yeah, so. it, even though I think some spots in Europe, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, it's uh, in a lot of places, it's, it is illegal. Um, which would be a good thing, in all honesty, because I'm tired of my email getting 200 emails a day, <laughs> man. But what do you do? Um, it touched on AI, bro. I guess like the final section would be AI. How are businesses and people going to navigate the treacherous waters of bad things like being produced with AI showing up on Google? How can, how can people really stay ahead of the game in terms of Google and social media with managing their reputation online? What is it that people can do? Because like you alluded to before, the whole deep fake stuff. Apart from deep fakes, what else can AI be doing to ruin our reputation online? Uh, I could think of an example of voice cloning. You know, that, So in voice cloning, not necessarily ruining your reputation, but possibly scamming you where somebody could take the voice of a close relative they could clone it, call you and say, hey, this is so-and-so, I'm jammed up, I need some money, can you send me some money really quick? Um, in terms of how AI could be used to damage your reputation, I think we haven't really, I feel like AI is so new that the average person or the average person who's a, a threat to another business, a small business, hasn't really figured that out yet. Um, I think AI is definitely moving really, really fast. Like, so for instance, I was just looking at a tool um, that I was, I was closing out some tabs in my my browser and one was like for some prompts written by so-and-so. And then now we have custom chat GPTs. So that's been rendered obsolete within like a month. So it's moving so fast, I would really be kind of hard to say what would be a threat. But I would say in terms of like scams, I think it definitely could be a, a huge threat and in terms of threat to being having your identity stolen or somebody compromising your bank account. I think it's a huge threat because people can 
deep fake documents. They could deep fake people in different situations. Soon we're going to have video where you'd be able to type in prompts and have video. So it could be somebody, if they had enough video or enough pictures of a relative, they could have a video or put something in where there looks like they're in the hospital and they're saying, oh, we need you to send this, this and this to get this person out of the hospital or they're in jail. We need you to send this. So I think that's more of a threat than anything to your reputation at this point. Um, but I think in terms of staying ahead of it, <laughs> I think that would be a full-time job. I mean, look at what's just happened in the last couple of days with uh, the CEO of OpenAI where he got fired, then he was hired back, then he was going to Microsoft, and then I just heard <laughs> that the guy that they appointed to replace him is going to resign. So there's a lot going on internally there that we don't even know. So it's moving really fast there. And then you're going to have, like now I just heard about um, Amazon launching some different courses and stuff in terms of about AI. Um, I don't know. I think it's moving. I think we're just at the beginning of it. And I, I think we all don't know. I think anyone that were to make any, any too sure of a prediction is kind of a fool. I think we just don't know yet. Yeah, it does. Like it really scares me for the noise that will be created, but I'm scared for the obfuscation of the truth. Like as an example, we'll be able to blame you do the road rage incident as talked about before. It's like, that wasn't me. That was a deep fake. Clearly <laughs> my head doesn't look like that. It's not me. I don't have that receding hairline, you know, <laughs> like I'm not thinning out on top. So yeah, like it's, that's where I'm really, I'm really nervous about it is because I think like everything's just all of the truth that society's finally been building up to, to get out, not to get philosophical, but, you know, like we've been building to finally break out into the real world. Oh, I'm like, damn, AI has come along and now it's just going to ruin said truth because everyone will just say that it's going to be AI. Um, but on that, man, I like, you're right. Yeah. Like I, it is something that I'm a bit nervous about, but hey, what do you do? <laughs> We're here now. So <laughs> I think one of the things, though, I mean, you, we just saw that Google rolled out now where you could see in search results the number of followers that different people have. So I think Google is dealing with this first in terms of like content on the internet that is generated by AI versus being generated by an authentic person who actually has experience or knowledge of whatever it is being said. And they're trying to suss that out and they're looking for, you know, what I would call like authority markers. So follower accounts on different platforms and then co-citations are just finding different instances of that person talking about said subject in other areas. So I feel like if we were to see something that seems out of the ordinary, I think it's important for us to kind of lean back on our critical thinking skills and try and do a little bit of research and not really take everything at face value. I think that is definitely um, going to be an issue. I mean, we've even seen some deep fakes of, I think, of Donald Trump a while back. Now, they were kind of more parody versus like legit videos where, you know, it's not like him sitting in the Oval office saying that we've been attacked by terrorists when that didn't happen or something along those lines. But I think that's going to be a real issue in the future. And I think one of the things that we're going to need is legislation that gets ahead of that and making sure that there are some very severe penalties for people who kind of do create that type of content. I think another thing is probably we're going to have to have some type of way to watermark it. And I think probably some technologies are looking at a way to try to watermark that kind of content. But at some point, the resolution and the, um, the I guess, the quality of it is going to be so good that we may not be, that might not be a thing. Um, so, but I do think you're onto something in terms of that and the truth being harder and harder to suss out. Well, I'm pretty positive that the oldies in Congress will figure it out, mate, because they're up with technology. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all across it, brother. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And I guess the final thing would be, what are the best ways that people can proactively protect their reputation. I, I know you alluded to the stuff before of making sure when you do get a bad review to reach out to the individual, but on the average day-to-day -day basis, not to have to go to those extremes, but just to keep an eye on it, make sure that the reputation is solid online. What are types of things that we can use? Are there, are there really good tools uh, that, you know, will help monitor that constantly? Yeah, I mean, the best tool that's free um, would be Google Alerts. So you can set up a Google Alert and be notified of something in real time as it happens or once a week or once a day. 
Um, but that's only one platform and kind of only one little specific area. So you would also have, you know, social media. Uh, you would also have things that are written or said about you offline. I think the best approach is to be proactive and not to be let things happen to you per se. So making sure that you're, if you're a business, having a PR strategy. So that way you're constantly putting out news about your business and yourself. And that would encompass video and that would encompass a lot of different channels. So that would encompass trying to get press offline. Um, it would also encompass you doing events. So like having, like, let's say offering a scholarship to students that decide that they want to go learn about digital marketing. And it could be like the Osborne scholarship. You know, that's a way for you to get links from EDU, um, different colleges and universities. That's a way for you to get press. That's a way for you to get good favor in the community and have people talking about you on social media. Uh, in terms of monitoring it, I think the best thing is probably Google alerts and then either manually checking it or signing up to some type of reputation monitoring service. So that way you can get kind of a bird's eye view of what's being said about you and your business. But the best thing to do is just be proactive and be putting out your own content and kind of controlling the narrative. If you're a person and more of like a, a brand, your personal brand is probably going to be really important as well. Not probably, it is going to be important. So making sure you're posting content that makes you a thought leader in your specific industry. Um, now we see that follower accounts are a thing in Google. So people are going to look at that and they're going to judge different people based on their follower accounts. So if they're looking for a realtor and they might, this may not be a thing yet, but it could be in the future where they might see that this person has 150,000 followers. This person only has 20,000 followers. I'm going to go with that realtor. It's kind of like how you're on Amazon. And if you look at a product and you see it only has five reviews, but they're five stars, but you see another product with 800 reviews and it's 4.8, you're probably going to go with the product with 800 reviews, even though the score is a little bit lower, just because there's a bigger sample size. So just being ahead of your brand, being a thought leader, if you're, if you're talking about yourself as a person, and you can still have a PR strategy, making sure you have a domain name for your first name, last name, dot com. That's kind of like the foundation or the bedrock of your reputation. And then basically putting out the content that you want, because that's usually going to rank number one for your name if you have your first and last name dot com. If you're looking at Bing, if you have the dot com, dot net, dot org, dot io, dot whatever, then that could kill, take up the whole first page. So uh, that is kind of like how I would approach personal branding. Also, you can you could do presentations. So you have like SlideShare. You can also do a podcast. Um, that's another way to build up your brand. And then making sure you connect all these different things that you do in terms of outreach uh, on your website. So that way Google has a way to see all that content in one area and connect it all to the different things that you're doing. Uh, and then just being on top of your social media. It's kind of a lot, but I mean, it is kind of a, a thing that is going to be more and more important as we have AI and we have the truth gets a little bit more fuzzy and there's different people who may, who may like AI. I think the biggest threat that it may pose is allowing people who have no experience or who don't know what they're doing to kind of be competitive in your industry because it allow them to fake it and fake what they are able to do when they're not able really to do it because they're assisted by AI, where if you have authentic experience and you're kind of on the forefront of the thoughts and the, and the, and the, and the different methods in your industry or whatever it is, or you're manufacturing or you're, if you're doing something for like products or whatever, that, that is easier for somebody to discern than if somebody is kind of like just using AI to kind of prop them up and make them look like they are more talented than they really are. And the final question I would have is what platform can do more damage to someone? So if you were to put all platforms like a TikTok, a Facebook, a Google, if you were to put all of them against one another, if you had one piece of bad information to go out there onto either platform, what one would you not want it to go on? Like, which one would you be like, look, it can go on all the other ones, but please not TikTok, please not Google. Where would you not want that bad information to be? Uh, I think it, I would say Google for me personally. I think uh, for the younger demographic, TikTok could be a little bit more damaging. I feel like a lot of younger people use TikTok more um, than they use Google uh, and they may not trust Google as much. Um, but any one platform can be pretty damaging if whatever you're doing is egregious enough to get spread around. So 
Um, and then vice versa. If you do something like, for instance, there was a woman who her car caught on fire and she made a TikTok and she was like, oh, my car, you know, it caught on fire. It's been a bad day. And then she is like, oh, my Stanley cup, it still has ice in it. And she was like, oh, look at this. So the social media department at Stanley, they saw that and they were like, oh, wow. Like this lady is talking about like our cup, it still has ice in our car. Like, you know, it's charted. And I was bad pressed for Kia because it was a Kia. Um, so the CEO of Stanley, that was an opportunity. So they took and they were like, look, you know, our cup still has ice in it. And this car caught fire. We're going to replace her cup and we're going to give her a new car. And then I saw that on LinkedIn. So that was a TikTok that went viral. Then the company responded to it, did something really good for that person. And then it went viral on LinkedIn, which is a platform I, you know, I consume, you know, more stuff on LinkedIn than I do TikTok. I don't ever really look at TikTok. I don't have it on my phone, but I, I'll see it periodically. Man, this has been very insightful, brother. Like where, where can people find you? Where, where do you offer up your services? Uh, I have provenremovals.com. That's our main site for just kind of any kind of broad content removal, review management, content suppression, um, any kind of crisis management situation that you're in. We have removemymugshot.org if you're just looking to remove a mugshot or some kind of criminal record. Um, and then if you're looking for reputation monitoring, um, you could go on either of those sites and find that information. And we'll probably offer something special to your audience as well. And you can put a link under the video if you want to do that. Awesome, brother. We'll make sure that that's down there. All links to Alex guys will be down below. <laughs> make sure you jump over, support his channel. And yeah, if you do have any uh, unfortunate events in your life, <laughs> Alex is the man to reach out to. Thanks for joining me, Alex. Ah, thanks for having me. Cheers, dude.